Okay, so from the training cases, we will use the rising bubble case. And to give you an idea of what this is, we'll be using the volume of fluid solver to calculate the cylindrical tank. And within that cylindrical tank, there will be a bubble of air rising towards the top. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to create a two-dimensional representation of this, which is basically a slice out of the 360 degrees. You know how to do that? No? Okay, so in Fluent you would have a solver, 2D, cylindrical, which will take into account the fact that you're solving on the slice, but in foam we have to do it with the same kind of solver. Okay? So our domain will have a shape of the slice of cheese, and the front and the back boundary of that slice of cheese need to describe to the solver that we're actually solving a 360 degrees uh, symmetric domain. Any idea what boundary condition we would use? Did I hear you say cyclic? Wedge. Wedge, okay. Uh, so if our flow is two-dimensional, then there is no flow in the third dimension along the wedge, and the boundary condition at the front and the back would be a wedge. Okay? When you make a wedge domain, then it is enough to have one cell thickness. If your flow is not purely two-dimensional, in fluent speak we would say two and a half D, in that case you can make a slice of say 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, and use a cyclic boundary condition left and right with the transformation which would allow your flow to go around. Okay? In order for the, cyclic, uh, for the wedge boundary condition to work, we have to specify the shape of the domain which will go from the center and then cut out the angle. Okay? So typically people tell me, what is the width of the angle? Well, it doesn't really matter, but a nice angle will be something like 5 degrees because the calculation of the volume need to take into account the difference between the big volumes on the side and little volumes in the middle. Okay? The second problem that I have to solve is field initialization. Do you remember what we did so far? We said the inlet velocity is 40 meters per second, uniform everywhere. Okay? But in my case, I have to say, well, this thing here is full with water, but inside of the circle, it will be air. So now you have two options. You can either write the numbers for the VOF field with ones and zeros by hand, which is okay unless there is half a million of them, okay? Or you need to use a tool which will allow you to set a non-uniform boundary condition. Anyone knows what the tool is called? Set fields, okay? So let us go into that case of the rising bubble take a look at the mesh structure and figure out how the thing should look like. So again, I will take a piece of my domain from here to here. Here and from here to here and the front and the back boundary of it will be of type wedge. Okay, so in constant polymesh block mesh dictionary. I am going to define my points. So 0, 0, 0, 0 0.5, 1 and a half, 2, 0, 0 0.5, blah, blah, blah. But notice that the x, and sorry, that the z location is not uniform and it changes with the radius. Okay? That's because my domain really needs to have that wedge shape. And you will also notice that I have quite a lot of points because I have the mesh refinement region around the bubbles. Okay? The important part that I wanted to show you is this part here. Okay? Now imagine, my domain is wedge shape, 
And here at the middle of the wedge, I have a point. Okay? My blocks are all defined as hexes, but I want them to be triangular prisms. Okay? So how will I do that? Well, I will repeat the zero point in the center. So it goes 0, 1, 5, 4, 0, 12, 15, 4. 0, 0, 4, 4. And block mesh will figure out that this is actually a wedge shape and eliminate the extra lines. Okay? So let us run block mesh on this geometry. And take a look at the result. You see the shape? Triangular. If I look at it from Z, you will see that I have quite a lot of mesh refinement down here, and I have a nasty corner in the mesh up here. Okay. Where do I define the wedge patch? Constant polymesh boundary. Okay, bottom, top, outer, you can recognize them, and back and front are my wedge patches. Now, please note, so out of this geometry, I will show it as outline now, I will pick out the back and front plane. See that? But the back and the front boundary need to be in separate patches. Okay, let me explain to you how this works. So if I sit in the cells in the middle of my domain, that middle plane needs to be aligned with one of the coordinate axes to help me with the transformation. When I have a boundary which is a wedge, I can take the data from this front plane, move them into the plane of the wedge and do the transformation mean rotation of the vectors and tensors to align it with the plane. Okay? I will do the same for the other plane, but that means that the front and the back boundary need to be separate. Okay? So unlike the two-dimensional domains where I could take the front and back and put them into the same empty patch, the front and back in this case need to be in two different patches because the rotation angle for the transformation is different. Okay? Once you build a domain like that, your solver doesn't need to know anything else because the transformation is already built in this business of rotating the fields into the edge and the rest of the deformation of space that corresponds to the uh, cylindrical geometry will be recognized because the volumes of the cell far away from the axis is bigger than the volumes of the cell next to the axis. Okay? The second thing that I want to talk about is the initialization itself. Okay? So currently, in the zero directory, I have a field alpha, and it basically says internal field uniform zero. Okay? Uh, for simple initialization like this, we will use a tool called set fields, which is controlled by a dictionary inside of the system directory called the set fields dictionary. Okay, so before we jump into that, how would you usually initialize a field like that? Well, you have to write a little bit of code, which says read in the alpha field, find out all the cell centers. If the cell center is within radius r of point 0, then set alpha to 0, otherwise set alpha to 1, right? 
Yeah, but you're not quite ready to do the writing of the code. Not to mention that I don't want to write a million of these codes over my career just to initialize the fields. Okay? However, your initialization can be arbitrarily complex. Okay? So if you want something that looks like waves, then you may well have to write your domain. But the set fields tool will help you with quote unquote everyday use. So let's have a look how it works. First part you know, format, class, dictionary, object, set, fields, dictionary. And then it's got a set of entries which says default field value. And it says, find a field called alpha and set it to 1 everywhere unless I tell you something else. Okay, so that will make my canvas paint alpha to 1. And then it will go through a list of regions. Right now, I'm going to have a region <laughs> called sphere to cell, which will say, for the center, x, y, z, and the radius of 0.4 millimeters, find all the cells that are within that radius, and set alpha to zero. Okay? Of course, you can overlay these regions one on top of the other, so one, the one that I have commented out says, for the box between minus blah, 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 also set alpha to zero. Any idea what that would do? So I have a cylindrical vessel. Down here I have a bubble. Everything is set to one, meaning water. Inside of the bubble I do air. And the box will basically set, well, at the top there is a free surface and there is also air. How do you run this thing? Go back to the case directory and type set fields. And it will tell you a bunch of nice things like create time, time is zero, create mesh, reading set fields dictionary, setting volume scalar field alpha, adding cells within sphere with center blah and radius blah, setting volume scalar field alpha. Look at this now. My internal field is no longer uniform, but it has got ones and somewhere down here zeros as well. <clears throat> so now if I color this with alpha, you can see what I did. Okay? For the cells within here, <coughs> alpha is set to 1. Okay. Can you please try and uncomment that block for the box at the top? Do initialization with that. And in your case, make your bubble maybe twice the size as mine. Okay. Would you know how to do that?
Got it? Okay. Now, can you tell me how big is this mesh? How many cells? You know where to look? Twenty thousand or check mesh tells me a bunch of things and among them is the number of cells here. 20,000. Okay, so what I expect from this simulation is that the bubble will start rising because of the parameters that we gave and the most important parameter that interests me right now is the gravity vector. Can you find the gravity vector for me? Will it be in constant or system? Constant. In the file? G. Well done. Can you tell me what direction it is? The y direction. Negative. Negative y. Great. Okay. Now, this is not enough for me because this time step, this simulation has got quite a small time step. So in order to make everything run faster, I want to run it in parallel. Okay. So the idea of running foam in parallel is to use something called the domain decomposition mode. Okay, so the idea of domain decomposition is that you will tell me how many processors you wish to use and I will take my original domain, chop it up into bits and to each bit I will assign a piece of the mesh. Okay, the idea is that all the processors have got the same size piece so that you can do the same amount of work. Okay, now the tool that we use for that is called decompose part, okay? And it will basically chop up the domain. It is controlled by a dictionary called decompose part dict that lives in system, okay? So both of these things are obvious. So let's just take a look at what the decompose part looks like. Okay, so the first thing that it will tell me is what is the number of subdomains. So in this case I want four subdomains and then it will tell me the decomposition method which here I called simple. Okay, do you remember the pattern that I showed you with the dictionaries before where simple has got simple coefficients and the idea of simple decomposition is tell me how many pieces you want in the x direction, y direction and z direction. And here I'm going into four bits, two in x, two in y, one in z, two times two is four, and everybody is happy. Okay? In order to run this, we will run a tool called decompose par. And I'm going to give it an option called cell dist, which means that it will write a field which says to which processor each cell will go. Now let's take a look at the outlet for output for a little bit. So it says create time, create mesh, selecting the composition method, finish the composition in 100 of a seconds, and then from the global mesh it calculates how much of the stuff goes to each of the pieces. Okay. When we finish with the decomposition, it will create a little mesh for each of the processors. And in my directory, apart from the original files, I will now have these processor directories. Okay? Now, please remember, these processor directories are not separate cases because they need to speak to each other. Okay? So within the processor directory, I will only have things that are different on each processor. And that will be mesh, so constant polymesh, 
and fields. Why are fields different? Well, because my big mesh had 20,000 cells, and here on processor 0, my piece for velocity has only 5,000 cells. Okay, so here we are, number of cells, 6637. Okay, now, if you take a look at the boundary file, it has got all the patches that we've seen before, bottom, top, outer, back, front, default faces, and then it's got some other stuff here which says processor 0 to 1, processor 0 to 3. Okay, so this, the way this works is basically each piece of the mesh on each processor is independent and between processors, what used to be internal faces are now a boundary patch, which says, oh, if you need to know the data here, go and speak to processor 3, and you will find the cells which are next to your processors on the other side. Okay? Also notice one thing. Okay? So here in patch outer, I have zero faces. Why is that important? Well, in principle there is no problem. It basically means that the cells that I picked out to live on processor zero do not touch the patch called outer. Okay? But imagine if I were solving flow around the car and I want to calculate the drag force. The way I would do that is I would ask each processor to sum up the force on the piece of the patch that belongs to the car, and then I would do global sum over all the processors, right? So what happens if a processor doesn't have a piece of the patch? I couldn't do the sum, right? Because it wouldn't know that we are asking about it. And for that reason, all of the patches, all of the processors have got all of the patches, even though the number of faces is zero. Okay, apart from the processor decomposition, in the zero directory of the global face, now I have a new field called cell disk. Do you remember what I said? Decompose par minus cell disk. Please tell me which cells belong to which process. Okay, so now if I visualize it, Apart from the field that I had before, I can show you which piece belongs to which processor. Any problem here? Well, the blue piece is smaller, right? Well, not really, because what counts is the number of cells and not the volume of the cells. Okay? The second thing is, you can see that I was quite cleverly using simple decomposition because I want two by two and my mesh is structured. But what if I have a big three-dimensional mesh and I want to decompose into 57 subdomains? Well, that simple decomposition doesn't work, so you can use some of the others. My favorite will be things like Metis or Scotch, which will allow you to decompose the mesh just by saying how many decompositions you want to have. Okay? As a part of this operation, we have also transferred the fields. So the initialization of the alpha field that we have done before has now been transferred onto individual processors. Okay? So let us start up this case. How many of you know how to run the case in parallel? Everybody? Almost. Okay? So what I told you before is that the piece on processor 1, here in blue, will need to exchange the information with the, the processor number 2 across this boundary to make sure that the whole thing works as a single simulation. Okay, so number 1, they need to know about each other. And number 2, there needs to be a mechanism that allows 
one process to speak to another process to transfer the data. Okay? For that, we use something called Open MPI, which is defined by the MPI standard, which tells you how to operate with this sort of protocols. Okay? For Open MPI to know that these things go together, I have to run the following command. MPI run minus NP number of processors for inter phone minus parallel. Happy? MPI run will launch four interphone processes and this minus parallel flag tells interphone that it will run in parallel. Okay. What happens if I forget the flag? They don't know about, about each other, they don't know about processor boundary, they all read the global case, and they all run on top of each other on the same data. So at least once a year I have somebody calling me up and saying, I'm running this case on my machine on six processors and so no faster than on one processor what is going on. Okay, well they forgot the uh, minus parallel flag. Right. How can you recognize whether your process is running in parallel or not? Okay, so the first thing is if I do top, you can see four copies of Interphone run. Okay. And the second thing, when you start up the run, you will see additional information here. Okay, so it says build, exec, date, host, process ID, number of processors is four, process ID are three, two, six, two, three, four, five, and six, which basically says that these four processors work together. The rest of the output file looks exactly the same. Okay, so if you're looking at your parallel run, and have the messages repeated four times, that means that something has gone wrong. So let's take a look at it. Okay, so here you can see the solution of all the bits. Progressing as it should. And with some luck it is going to be faster than running on a single CPU. Okay, now these processors in a real parallel cluster will end up on a different hardware, right? So each will be run on a different CPU, which will make them all faster, but it will write its own data, which means that my data, rather than producing directory 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, etc., in my case directory, will now seem to not be there. Okay, you see it still says zero. And according to my file, I have already got to triple O three seconds. Okay, so my data should appear here in the processor directory, but not quite yet by the looks of things. So here it says write interval every 10 to the minus 3 seconds. Okay. Now, what happens if you forgot to run the initialization of the field using set fields before we decompose the case? Well, nothing. Set fields is also an open form executable and it can run in parallel. Okay, so you can go MPI run minus NP4 set fields with any of the options minus parallel and it will execute parallel initialization. Okay, any problems? Yeah, there is still a problem of mesh generation. Okay, originally if you imported the mesh from the outside the mesh converter does not run in parallel because the first step is make the mesh for everything and then chop it up in parallel as well. Okay, so that will typically be your the bottleneck However, some of the mesh generators that come with foam, like for example Snappy, 
are capable of producing the mesh in parallel in the first place. Okay, a question. Now we're running on four processors. What happens if I change my mind and I have to run in seven? Well, I would reconstruct the data back onto one, delete my four processors, decompose into seven, and carry on running. Okay, with the newer versions, we have parallel uh, redistribution uh, tools, but they are not quite as mature that I would ask you to do them on the basic train. Okay? Now, in terms of post-processing, this is also a bit of a problem, because processor zero, processor one, two, and three are actually separate meshes that you can look at. Okay? Do you want us to try and look at processor zero on its own? Let's do it. So if I go to processor zero, I can do ln minus s dot dot system here, run paraphone. And I can see the piece that belongs to processor zero. In fact, I even have the first result. Okay, well, this is a bit unsatisfactory, right? Because I have to guess the processor on which there is interesting stuff. Or alternatively, I would have to do something to make sure that looking at the parallel data is easy. Okay? So the traditional way of looking at the parallel data would be to wait for the processor to output the data. You see here I have a time step 0.001. Okay. And then I would do the step which is opposite from decompose par, and that's called reconstruct par. Okay. So what this does, it collects the bits that belong to separate processors and puts back together the fields and any additional information like finite area, sprays, etc., back as if this was a single processor run. Okay? If during the simulation your mesh changes topologically, this is a little bit more complicated because you have to rebuild the mesh first and then rebuild the fields, but the principle is the same. After this operation, I now have 0 0.001 and Paraphone will allow me to look at my results that I created in parallel. Now you can see that I screwed up here at the top, but uh, one thing at a time. Okay. Now this is not really practical, right? Because if you're running in parallel, you probably have a good reason. A good reason for running in parallel will be that your mesh is really big. If the mesh is big, you don't want to have multiple copies of the data. Okay? Fortunately for that reason, Paraview has got this little button here where you can click on reconstructed case or decomposed case and take a look at the whole thing in one piece. Okay? So now if I wait a little bit and tidy up things here. Okay, so now in my run, hopefully I'm going to have time to as well, a little bit longer to wait. I can do paraphone minus native reader. And then choose to look at a decomposed case. Okay. 
Okay, so once I do that, I no longer have to go through decomposition and reconstruction. Okay, now there is a slight problem. Okay, imagine how I have multiple domains, meaning that I also have a set of points somewhere in here which simultaneously belong to processor 0 and to processor 1, right? Part of you does not know that these points are connected across the domains because all it did was to read the mesh from one processor into another and it doesn't know how to relate, uh, how to relate them to each other. Okay, so sometimes when you're doing parallel processing on a decomposed case, you can see a kink on isosurfaces and similar small problems where the domains connect. Okay, if you're not too picky, just carry on looking and enjoy the speed. If you are picky, reconstruct and then take a look at the reconstructed case, which will give you the phone data and then the interfaces will be completely smooth. Okay, so while this is running, I need you to create a three-dimensional way down break case like the one that I have shown you in the slides. Like this. Okay, do you know how to do it? Start from the dam break tutorial, throw the mesh away, and make me a three dimensional mesh with how many blocks? One, two, three in the front plane, four, five around the block, and three in the back, all together eight. How many boundaries? Well, to the bottom, left, right, uh, front, back, column, and the top boundary. Okay, to make your life easier, I will allow you the block to go all the way to the top. Scared? Okay, I suggest coffee break. And then after coffee, we will build this. Now beware, I can do it in about 10 minutes, okay? Which means that you should be able to do it in about an hour. Coffee.